1980, a French engineer entered into Mount Elgon National Park in Uganda and descended into Kittim Cave, a local attraction. One week later, sick with a headache that persisted despite taking multiple rounds of painkillers, he decided to stay home. That pain began to spread across his back and through his body, and three days later he began to vomit. His eyes remained almost frozen in their sockets and his skin turned yellowish as small red speckles began to emerge. Desperately in search of a treatment, he boarded a plane to Nairobi as his nose began to bleed and he began heaving a dark, thick, black liquid. Upon arriving at the hospital, he died. In 1987, a Danish boy climbed the very same mountain and explored the cave during a family vacation. 11 days later, he too had died from similar symptoms. On the 20th of September 2022, the Mubende district in Uganda declared a state of emergency as citizens began to fall ill. Severe headache, fever, aches and pains, leading to abdominal pain, vomiting and unexplained hemorrhaging. The culprits among all these cases were a family of viruses called phyloviruses. The most recent in the district in Uganda, Ebola. The Danish schoolboy, Raven virus. And for the French engineer, Marburg virus. What's more shocking is that all three of these viruses were thought to originate from the same cave system. But how did this location become the deadliest cave in the world? Okay, let me start this story with a description that I found of the walk up to Kittim Cave documented by one visitor. They write, On the route up to Kittim Cave, nettles line the path, prickling and creating punctures on the skin. A swarm of moths and other flying insects seems to perpetually whirl around the mouth of the cave. There are sharp salt crystals lining portions of the walls and the roof, and the abrupt low ceilings in certain places make it almost inevitable to bump or cut your shoulders or head. The cave itself feels unusually dry and dusty, and there lingers a strange feeling in the air. And really, it's Kitten Cave's origin that is as, I think, fascinating as its reputation is morbid. It was formed about 7 million years ago when the volcanic Mount Elgon erupted and buried the surrounding rainforest in ash. Kittim Cave, in essence, is a rainforest that has been encased in solidified volcanic ash and lava flows. But it gets weirder. In what honestly sounded pretty ominous when I first read it, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, animals have traveled into the cave in the dead of night. They are driven there by the very nature of the cave itself. Its volcanic origins mean that the cave walls are densely packed with salt and mineral deposits, which are vital to the local animal life. But what's truly strange is that it's the largest visitors to this cave that are actually responsible for how large the cave system has become. Those visitors are elephants. Using their massive tusks, these elephants pull off chunks of the wall and crush and lick at the salt. Kittim Cave is one of the only locations on Earth where this behavior can be observed, and over the centuries, it's resulted in a noticeable increase in the size of the cave because essentially the elephants are mining. If you go in, you can look at the walls and the ceiling and you can see tusk marks by the thousand. However, even for these elephants, the depths of this cave aren't without their dangers. There is a deep crevasse into which many younger, more inexperienced elephants have fallen. And no, before you panic, I'm not gonna show you a video of a baby elephant falling into a crevasse. I was worried too when I first saw this footage. There is, however, an elephant graveyard that's been discovered as their carcasses become mummified in the dry cave environment. This mining activity of these elephants draws in other animals, including bushbuck, buffalo, and hyenas, who come to Kittim Cave to consume the salt left over by the elephants. And those aren't the only inhabitants. The walls and floors of the cave are coated in bat droppings from a local population of fruit-eating and insect-eating bats that call the cave home. And if you go to look into the crevices of the cave, you will find a population of spiders scuttling over the walls, feeding on the insect population in the cave. 
And now this sounds like a wonderful mecca of animal existence until you remember that somewhere among these populations, researchers believe that some of the most deadly viruses ever to have been discovered may reside and hide waiting to jump into human visitors. What I want to tell you about today is the story behind what it took to uncover that culprit hiding in the darkness. But first, a quick message from our sponsor, Brilliant. We all dream of being that person who learns something new every day, but the reality is it's hard to do. Brilliant is the best way to learn math and computer science. When I was doing my PhD, so much of my time was spent playing with complex ideas Brilliant brings those sorts of ideas to life with interactive elements, so you aren't memorizing ideas, but instead you're playing with them and learning intuitively how they behave. Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from foundational and advanced mathematics, to scientific reasoning, logic, even special relativity, with new lessons added monthly. I recently checked out Brilliant's course on waves and light. They have a really fun simulation on what happens to polarized light, which allows you to get hands-on and finally start to understand how quantum strange light really is. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium membership. Now back to the video. Before the infections of the French engineer and the Dutch schoolboy, Marburg hadn't been seen since 1975, when it infected three people in South Africa. A similar pattern had been seen in Ebola during a stretch of 17 years from 1977 to 1994, not a single confirmed human death from infection had occurred. And this isn't a subtle illness, this is the thing that doesn't easily go unnoticed. If it had been circulating in a human population for those 17 years, we absolutely would have known about it. When we find a disease in nature that can jump from animal to human, we refer to them as zoonotic viruses. The natural place we thought to start this search was in animals that were closely related to us, that we assumed would be easier for the viruses to make the jump into humans. But when we started to look at some of the African animal populations like chimpanzees or gorillas that are closely related to us, we quickly noticed that the field studies had shown die-offs of chimp and gorilla populations that had occurred at about the same time, at about the same areas, as when humans had experienced outbreaks of Ebola or Marburg. And in fact, these viruses had often completely decimated ape populations. So although we knew they were susceptible, the same logic kind of applied. These viruses probably weren't hiding in apes, waiting to jump to us, because as soon as they turned up in populations of apes, that group was wiped out. So they probably weren't the long-term hosts of the virus. The creature in which zoonotic viruses exist over the long term, usually without causing too many symptoms, is known as a reservoir host. For example, monkeys and mosquitoes serve as reservoir hosts for yellow fever virus. This article says dogs potentially can be a host of possible transmission for human strong gylodiasis disease, making them reservoir dogs. It was when the two localized Marburg and Raven infections of 1980 and 1987 occurred so close together geographically that researchers really hoped they might be able to find the reservoir species, maybe somewhere within the cave. I found a report from the lead virologist, a guy called Dr. Eugene Johnson, who stated that upon entering the cave, he was so completely certain, absolutely sure, that he had come to the home of nature's most proficient killer. The cave was closed to the public while his research team suited up in a heavy duty protective gear as they scoured the cave walls, sampling bat and elephant droppings and capturing samples of the wildlife that lived inside the cave. But it turns out that when all was said and done after several months of investigation, he left empty handed. If the viruses had lurked in Kittum Cave somehow, they had again vanished without a trace. They accepted that they were just gonna have to wait for the pattern of the vanishing killer to resurface once again. After a few apprehensive years, officials eventually decided to reopen the cave to the public. If anyone else is looking at their screen right now and praying for this guy not to go in the cave, know that I am right there with you. And it took seven years to catch a further break in the story. In 1995 came another outbreak, Ebola this time, not Marburg virus. 
thousands of miles away in the city of Kikwit, which is in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. In total, there were 315 cases and 254 deaths, and the origin of the disease, patient zero, was traced back to a farmer who had been making charcoal in the forest area at the city's edge. Researchers at Kikwit took blood and tissue from a wide selection of animals, including many insects, but again, screening those samples back in the lab, they found no evidence of any of the viruses. In honestly what sounds like an act of desperation as much as it does maybe questionable morality, the researchers tried an experimental approach in some of the highest level biosafety labs. They began injecting live Ebola virus from the Kikwit outbreak into 24 kinds of plants and 19 kinds of animals, ranging anything from spiders and millipedes to lizards, birds, mice, bats, and then monitored these animals to see if they became infected with Ebola. And what's interesting is that in all but a few of these species, Ebola failed to take hold in the organism. All of them except for three. A single spider, a single fruit bat, and a single insect-eating bat. However, in any of these samples, the viral load, the quantity of the virus that is in the solid tissue of the blood of the creature that was detected in any of these animals was so low, probably wasn't actually able to reproduce in those animals. In fact, in both of the bat species, the virus lasted for about 12 days before it was eliminated from the body. So how could these be the reservoir hosts of the Ebola virus? The next snapshot that researchers got, they had to wait for a further 12 years. In 2007, a short distance from Kitam Cave, Kitaka Mine experienced an outbreak across its miners of the Marburg virus. Scientists, for the very first time when they went out to survey the local animal population, found evidence of the virus in a local Egyptian fruit bat. The same species of bat that had been found years previously in Kittim Cave. Researchers estimated that only about 5% of the 100,000 bat colony at Kitaka was actually infected. It was the very first time that hard data implicating bats as a major natural reservoir of the virus had been detected. But here we have to ask ourselves, why had it taken researchers so long to manage to make this detection? Why hadn't they found it during any of the numerous previous outbreaks? And still to this day, as for the reservoir for Ebola virus, we actually have still no solid evidence as to its source in the wild. To answer this question, let's start by looking at the viruses. What you notice across outbreaks is the remarkable genome stability of the virus over the years. It doesn't really seem to change or evolve at all, at least until the most recent outbreaks where the number of infected was so high it had much more opportunity to mutate. That stability might actually tell us something, that somewhere there is potentially a bottleneck in these viruses' ability to reproduce. It could be that these viruses require a highly unusual set of circumstances, potentially something like a two-host system, perhaps a mammal host such as a bat species that becomes infected only intermittently when it gets bitten by a spider or tick or other insect species. That insect species may ultimately actually be the real reservoir host. But what that means is that the possibility for these viruses crossing over into humans or anything human-like is so unbelievably small that tracking down these occurrences is nearly impossible. And this isn't a totally wild theory. There are plenty of examples of other two host systems in the wild. In Australia, fruit bats also host the Hendra virus, which can jump into horses and then from horses into horses horse handlers and veterinarians, oftentimes proving fatal. What I think is so fascinating is that it's so incredibly difficult to find these reservoir hosts because, well, often when you go to take measurements, the viral load exhibited in those species is often very, very low. It tends to be much lower in a reservoir host than in an animal or person suffering from an actual acute infection because otherwise it would probably kill the reservoir host. And these hosts are where the virus can for some reason exist, but not thrive. 
These viruses we've already seen in the bat population exist at incredibly low prevalence within a population, maybe as little as one in a hundred. So the probability not only that you catch a representative example of that species, but that that representative example is also infected with the virus, again, is fleetingly improbable. The other point that I think is just absolutely fascinating is why, time and time again, do we see bats as so commonly the target for disease-carrying vectors? There is something absolutely remarkable about the nature of a bat as a virus carrier. Their tolerance for viruses is vastly superior to any other mammal, likely because they are consumers by the ton of common disease-carrying insects that also prey on animals. So they are essentially acting as a virus accumulator, so their systems better be incredibly good at dealing with viruses. They are also, unfortunately, the only flying mammal, giving them huge ranges over which, yes, they can scour for food, but ultimately they can also spread disease. Further research has pointed at the region around Mount Elgon National Park, where several key bat species are believed to be resident, as very likely the hiding spot of all of these diseases, if not where they first originated from. We'll likely not ever find out what it is about this cave system that manifests such brutal viruses, but the proximity between so many animal populations over so many thousands of years may have just been the perfect petri dish to develop a deadly concoction. The lesson here is that as we push into unexplored animal habitats, the chance we encounter more of these natural impossibilities kind of becomes certain. Whatever the reason behind it, Kittim Cave nestled in Mount Elgon National Park, Uganda, may just be the deadliest cave in the world. Hey guys, thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to leave a like or a comment, maybe subscribe to the channel. Thanks very much for watching. I will see you next time.